Hi, I just wanted to share with you one uh, of those books that have made a big difference, made it particularly some years ago, uh, made a huge impact on my thinking when I was a Christian and also subsequently after that as well. And it's a book by uh, the British biblical scholar James D.G. Dunn, or Jimmy Dunn, as he was known. He was probably one of the most distinguished New Testament scholars in the world. Um, uh, he was a professor at Durham University um, and produced uh, incredible tomes, particularly towards the latter part of his life. He churned out some amazing scholarship, which was uh, almost universally uh, acclaimed for its uh, erudition and its uh, balance and uh, just extraordinary analysis of biblical texts and the earliest history of Christianity based in Jerusalem with James or Christology or the unity and diversity of Christianity in the uh, early decades of the first century. Um, but this particular book was um, a real eye-opener to me. I've, it's, um, it's not easy reading, it's not introductory reading. I, I think it's probably a, a ma at master's level. Um, it's written for scholars, I guess, and for students. Um, and it's, what, over 400 pages of um, scholarship. And it's called Christology in the Making, a New Testament inquiry into the origins of the doctrine of the Incarnation. So obviously this is an academic work, and this brief video is an academic video, so um, apologies if that's not what you want to hear. But um, So th this book, as I say, had a, a major impact. And I just want to read um, an extract from it, um, just to illustrate uh, the kind of issues that it tackles. In, in, the, early, uh, in the early pages, he looks at... Um, terms like son of God when applied to Jesus or even on the lips of Jesus and he asked what that would have meant to um, the people who heard that term or, or understood how they understood it in the first century what does the first century context of meaning tell us about the meaning of that term is it does it simply mean God as it came later to mean in the Catholic tradition or did it have other meanings and he he explores uh, the, the, quite a diversity of meanings it had, and it certainly didn't mean Yahweh or the Lord of the God of the universe. It, it was applied to human beings and to angels and to um, kings and so on. It didn't mean, mean God, although it later came to be God. Um, and then he, he, he moves on on page 31 um, to look at uh, the question of um, whether or not John's gospel, the fourth gospel, can come to our aid, he says. Can it give us a clearer um, window into Jesus' own understanding of uh, himself and into the belief of the author um, about Jesus' own status? Is that clearer? Can the testimony of the fourth gospel be called in to give a clearer answer? Certainly John's answer seems clear enough, Jimmy Dunn writes. A regular feature of John's discourses, sorry, Jesus' discourses in the fourth gospel is precisely his talk of God as his father and of himself as God's son. He calls God father more than a hundred times and himself son 23 times. For the first time, for the, fir for the first time, we find one of the key words of the later creeds used of Jesus, uh, monologies, only begotten as it's usually translated. Um, not only in the prologue, but in one of Jesus' discourses as well, in chapter 3. And then he says, linked with the father-son theme is the regularly expressed conviction of his own pre-existence, of a prior existence in heaven with God the Father. And he's quoting passages here that reference this. Uh, of Jesus' descent from heaven, of his coming from God into the world. And the climax is probably reached in the most powerful of the I am sayings where Jesus' claim to pre-existence achieves its most absolute expression before Abraham was I am. That's 8.58 in John's Gospel. So a clear enough picture emerges, he says. And, and this is um, key to evangelistic proclamation. I mean, classically in the famous Billy Graham rallies, Billy Graham would say, look, this is what Jesus said. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the resurrection of the light, and so on and so on. All these amazing statements come from the from only one gospel, actually, the John, John's gospel, the last to be written. So it's this really crucial um, textual evidence, it seems, for the deity of Jesus and his uniqueness 
and necessity of acknowledging that for our salvation throughout the world. So Jimmy Dunn continues, but, he says, and this is a big but, can we assume that John's intention was to give these various expressions as utterances of the historical Jesus? So he's here um, contrasting the Jesus of the Gospel, the fourth Gospel, with um, the historian's reconstruction of the, if you like, the historical Jesus, the real Jesus of history, as opposed to simply reading off from the page of a Gospel and taking that as a verbatim um, photograph, literal um, account, verbatim script, you know, writing down what was actually said on those occasions. Can we assume that John's concern at this point was to paint a portrait of Jesus as he actually was, to record like a faithful stenographer what he actually said? The assertion of the fourth gospel as a the reassertion, Jimmy Dunn says, of the fourth gospel as an historical re or source and the renewed realisation that its tradition has firm historical roots, at least in several places, gives some encouragement on this score. Unfortunately, however, it is precisely at the point which concerns us that the case is weakest. Precisely here that the indications are strongest that John is presenting us with developed rather than original tradition. Developed meaning it's something that he himself has um, elaborated and created rather than simply the original words of Jesus that he received and wrote down. So he continues, consider the following points. And he says, Dodd's careful comparison, Dodd was another British New Testament scholar of an earlier generation, Dodd's careful comparison of Johannine and uh, synoptic traditions has indeed brought out, brought to our attention several sayings and sequences of sayings which most probably stem from synoptic or synoptic-like tradition. But he has also highlighted still more clearly how distinctive the Johannine discourses, which make use of those sayings, constructed on a characteristic pattern which has no parallel in the synoptic Gospels. No one can dispute the vast differences between the discourse style in the Gospel of John, so you get these long, long, long kind of prayers or long, long sermons, if you like, uh, uh, sayings of Jesus that, are, that go sometimes over several chapters, and you don't really find anything like that in the synoptics. And so he compares that with Jesus' teaching in the synoptics. And he continues, The point is that the style is so consistent in John, whether he is in Galilee or Judea, to crowd or individual, to peasants or Pharisee, to disciples or hostile Jews, and so consistently different from the synoptics, that it can hardly be other than a Johannine literary product, developing and shaping the tradition according to a pattern largely imposed on it. The best explanation still remains that the Johannine discourses are meditations or sermons on individual sayings or episodes from Jesus' life, but elaborated in a language and theology of subsequent Christian reflection. Now, that's quite a densely packed statement, but basically the substance of John is, is an elaboration from perhaps a simpler root, uh, maybe a synoptic-like saying of Jesus, uh, and then it's elaborated and worked on over and over, uh, infused with John, whoever John is, uh, his, his own theology, his own understanding of who Jesus is, and this is then presented in this extraordinary fourth gospel, which is so unlike, in many ways, the earlier three. So this is uh, a gospel that is substantially or even largely the product of Christian reflection rather than a, as I say, an historical account in a modern biographical style that we would expect of a modern story of someone we knew. Someone famous like the prime minister or a famous footballer or a president, we would expect an account of their life, a biography, to be critically accurate and balanced and, and uh reference with with accuracy historical reliability and that's not what we're seeing is john's purpose at all and it's a mistake to anachronistically to read back into the first century ancient biographies our own modern understanding of biography which is actually quite different in important ways and he and dimmy then gives a a fascinating um example using statistics 
I don't normally like statistics, but this is a really good one. In particular, he says, this is clearly true of the whole father-son tradition in John. So you notice how in John it's so emphasised. The language is always about the son and the father, the father sending the son, the son uh, glorifying the father, and so on. Jeremiah, this is another scholar, has noted the following statistics for the use of father for God in the words of Jesus. Mark, three instances. Q, four instances. Special Luke, four. Special Matthew, 31. John, 100. So we go from Mark, three instances of the father, sorry, of God being called the father in Mark to a hundred in John. And he draws, Jeremiah draws the inevitable conclusion, which is there was a growing tendency to introduce the title father for God into the sayings of Jesus, end quote. So the idea of God calling, Jesus calling God father is in an emphatic and regular and characteristic way is perhaps a later tradition and not goes but doesn't go back so so clearly to the earliest evidence that we have and of course the late tradition emphasizing the fatherhood and the sonship of Jesus and God then that easily uh, leads on into trinitarian language of the father and the son being co-equal being both fully divine um, again we see this this uh proto-trinitarian language kind of leading into that later on so um he continues um so there's this growing tendency um even more striking are the statistics for the phrase the father just the father only one instance in mark one in q two in luke so this is a special luke material luke unique to luke uh special matthew one and 73 in the Gospel of John. On this evidence, it is scarcely possible to dispute that here we see straightforward evidence of a burgeoning tradition of a manner of speaking about Jesus and his relation with God, which became very popular in the last decades of the first century. So we see a trajectory clearly to elaborate certain characteristic ways of speaking about Jesus and God in terms of son and father, which were not so um, well founded in the original Jesus sayings, but became elaborated and um, increased over time. Um, and just to fast forward to the next page, uh, he, he gives his conclusion. Um, the upshot of all this is that despite the renewal of interest in the fourth gospel as an historical source for the ministry of Jesus, it will be verging on the irresponsible to use the Johannine testimony on Jesus' divine sonship in our attempt to uncover the self-consciousness of Jesus himself. It will be verging on the irresponsible to use John's testimony on Jesus' own divine sonship in our attempt to clarify, uncover Jesus' own self-awareness about his status and his relationship with God. And this this statement, which is in italics in the book, um, uh, which is Dunn's way of emphasising his point, this explains why virtually all scholars, New Testament scholars, don't use John's Gospel as an historical source for reconstructing the life and self-understanding and Christology of Jesus. Because it is late, it is highly developed, for the reasons uh, he has demonstrated and other reasons as well. So um, there's much more that can be said. He talks about the pre-existence uh, statements and, and where they came from um, and so on. But I'm not going to read all that. I do, if you are so inclined, uh, I do recommend this text, actually. Um, it's a seminal work. It's um, one of those books in New Testament studies that just have to be read. Um, both because it's by Jimmy Dunn and because it is Christology in the Making, which is his one of his seminal works. They've influenced a generation of scholars, um, and is still and he's very readable and he's very sane and very balanced. He's not given to flights of speculation and um, uh, and he's not tendentious. He doesn't have a go. He does. He's not obviously biased, although he obviously has his view. Um, someone I know from Speakers Corner. Um, asked him if he was a Trinitarian, and he said he was. That's it. Till next time.